Hello everyone, I'm Kevin, by the way, someone else for BX257, here to bring you another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review, and today, continuing on with my Navy theme month, I'm going to be taking a look at the 1988 Cobra Bug, and its driver, the Secto Viper. Unfortunately, the Bug and Secto Viper do not make any animated appearances, at least not in cartoon form. Of course, they've been animated for the commercials for the toy. But the Bug actually makes a cameo appearance, sort of, in the old Marvel comic run of G.I. Joe, and issues number 73, where the Joes mention a tracked submarine that they've uh, seen the evidence of. However, it isn't until issue 76 that we get to see the fully operational Bug and its Secto Viper drivers. The Cobra Bug is a rather large vehicle, measuring about 15 inches in length and around 9.5 inches tall. If you're wondering what Bug stands for, seeing as it has a double G at the end and that's not really how you spell Bug, as far as I can tell, it doesn't stand for anything. It looks like an acronym, but there is no official translation as to what those letters mean. Starting with its armament, the bug has twin chin cannons underneath each of its canopies. Each of them can swivel all the way around as well as elevate and depress. Although this thing depresses so far, it actually goes in a complete 180 degree arc. Above those, we have these single barrel large cannons, which can swivel around, elevate and depress a little bit. And at the back of the bug, we have a manned cannon with twin barrels. And while it can't depress all that much, it can elevate almost 90 degrees here. And of course, the turret in which the gunner sits could swivel all the way around. And underneath that, we have a large torpedo as well as a missile. Now this is a configuration that I like on this pontoon portion. The torpedo being on the, uh, on the side with the missile being underneath, although as as far as being a torpedo goes, you probably would want it closer to the waterline. But I think it just looks better this way. However, this is not the official way you're supposed to put that on there. It's supposed to look like this. Obviously, with the missile being a bit higher. The torpedo is a very, very large item here. With the nice red pieces on the ends. And we have the strange forked missile here. It's very skinny, but we actually get four of these. There's two extra mounted on this side door. And now it's time to take a look inside of the bug. I'll just remove these missiles. You don't really have to, to open up the door, but I'm just going to because, well, I like the detail here, which uh, the missiles obscure. But you do have to get the guns out of the way sometimes when you're opening these doors, as they flip open like this. And while that sounded really bad, what that uh, click was, was a little tab, which is right here along the hinge, right in the middle there which is right on the sort of roof line. And once you get it past that and clicks, it actually helps the door stay open rather than slamming shut. Inside we have seating for two, each with their own seat belt, as well as control panels on the far side, which is a little bit hard to see, unfortunately. They look out with the bug through this double bubble canopy piece here. Unfortunately, this isn't meant to be removed, but it can be as it just sort of clicks in here like this. And I'm just going to remove this just to show you a bit more detail in there. This is the driver's seat, actually. This is where the Secto Viper really should be sitting. Most of the time, however, the Secto Viper will be displayed 
in this cockpit, which is not the drive section, nor should it be. As you can see, this thing has a clamshell sliding canopy glass, which is really cool. But the reason why he shouldn't be in there is because this is a removable submarine pod. Be very careful to lift up this tab here just by pushing it back a little bit will unlock this entire thing and you'll be able to pull this thing forward. Putting it back in is a lot less scary than taking it out, believe me, as this thing has two prongs here as well as the tab which you uh, have to hold back here. What's on the bottom here is actually a uh, a, a kind of a large nubbin and that's where if when you're putting it back in you actually rest the, the back portion of the sub on the bottom here and then sort of angle this stuff back in the submarine pod can now be used as a scout vehicle for the rest of the bulkier heavier craft as you can see, it has propeller detail at the back here, which is pretty cool. Unfortunately, it doesn't move. This is all just one piece of plastic, unfortunately. Even more unfortunately is the fact that the propellers are actually cut off at the top and the bottom here just to allow it to click into um, the bug base. As you can see, these are the holes which had the, uh, which were for the side tines as well as this top portion, which is where you unlatched it. But as you can see, it actually does have movable veins. So you can move these around and it has a bar on the bottom, which allows it to move in sync with the other one. And as for the detail inside, you're able to fit two figures in here and they both have seat belts. The submarine pod is not the bug's only auxiliary craft. We have two more. In these side doors, you uh, do have to put the back cannon out of the way in order to open them. But we have a pair of jet skis. Just taking this one out, you can see at the back wall of the storage area, there's actually that little tab there. And that hooks on to the back of the tab here, so that this thing not only fits in there flat to the ground. As you can see, each of the jet skis has their own armament in the form of these tiny black missiles. But the design of the jet skis themselves are very strange. While they look fairly aqua-dynamic, the fact of the matter is, is that you're supposed to raise up the control arms this way and the figure is supposed to hold the handles from the outside from where they're standing. And that's where the foot peg is. That's a lot of really nice detail, which they didn't really have to do, but it's there. But it seems Hasbro does know what it's doing because although awkward looking, the grips on the outside of the frame actually do reach the uh, figure's hands quite naturally. The jet skis have one more secret, however, and that is on the bottom, where it has a back peg. So these actually can be stored on the figures, and they can just carry them around. No need to put them back into the bug when you don't have to, I guess. One very interesting thing is, uh, these jet skis always remind me of the 1988 vehicle action packs. And finally, we have the rear door, which is openable by these two tabs here. They're very small and very innocuous. You almost want to try and grab the corners because they do stick out from the main frame here but it can be a little bit difficult if this thing is really locked down or tight. So you're supposed to unlock it by pushing these things up and the entire thing, bubble and all, open up 
and there's room for three figures, although I'm sure you can squeeze a few more in there, but they're really only meant for three. Two at the side here, which are actually meant to sit down bench style, and one in the gunnery compartment. As I'm demonstrating here, you can see that you can use the foot peg just to have a figure standing up, but he stands up just a little bit beyond the frame here, so you can't really close the door unless you want to knock him on his head. He really is supposed to be sitting the way this figure is. I love the little detail of the steps leading up to the gunnery pit, especially as when the figures are properly seated, they're not actually in the way of the path of the gunner going up here. And while the gunnery pit does not actually have any detail on the inside of it, it does have all the controls on the top here. So the figure can just stand there, you can close this thing up, and look through the bubble. Unfortunately, the gunnery pit itself does not rotate along with the uh, bubble turret itself. So if you have it forward or sideways or something like that, you do have to constantly open the door and reposition the figure inside if that's the sort of thing that bothers you. One detail that really baffles me is the side pontoons on the bug. While the pontoons themselves make sense, they have jet intake detail on the front of the back, well, maybe propeller detail, which will allow the bug, a mostly wheeled vehicle, to travel on the water as it does on land. The fact of the matter is, is that they have controls on the tops of these pontoons, which to me makes no sense. These pontoons are not removable from the vehicle. Perhaps sometime, somewhere in the design stage they were, just like the jet skis were, but to me that seems kind of redundant. But then again, the 1990 Hammerhead sort of did that, but uh, I'll discuss that in just a bit. But as you can see, you're meant to just sort of lie a figure down on there, and it almost looks like he's operating the torpedo or the missile or something like that. But that seems a rather strange place to be doing that from. Underneath the vehicle, we have the six wheels, which were actually shared by a couple of different vehicles over the years. But you can see, there's a lot of really nice detail underneath here. They're all attached by these uh, individual axles, which is very strange. Uh, I'm not quite sure why they didn't just cheap out and just put pegs sticking straight out of the hull, but, well, whatever. It's a nice bit of detail there. Unfortunately, I kind of really wish that they, uh, I mean, seeing as they had six wheels, they could have just kept these two here, but kept this axle a little bit forward because it seems like the weight of the vehicle is unbalanced and it tends to kind of droop on the front here. I understand that a lot of collectors really don't like the Cobra Bug. It's one of those vehicles that you really have to either grow to love or you just never will. Honestly, it has very odd proportions. It has a bubble motif going all over the vehicle as well as these patchwork doors making this thing kind of the Partridge family bus of Cobra Assault vehicles. I know that probably dated me very heavily, but it's kind of true. It's just a very odd, very singular looking uh, Cobra vehicle. And I've certainly grown to love this vehicle. I love the asymmetry now that I've gotten used to it, and the bubbles make sense. They go along with the driver. One very interesting thing is that I feel that this perfectly encapsulates what it's meant to do. It's supposed to be a shoreline defender. It's supposed to defend Cobra Island specifically. So, you know, you have your, your wheels for it to go along the sand. You have your scout vehicle in the form of this detachable sub in case it detects anything strange. And of course, you have those jet skis, which can act as an escort for this vehicle as well. Now, one thing I haven't discussed is how many figures can actually fit in this thing. And I kind of count about nine, about four in the front, three in the back, and two on the pontoons. And an extra two if you're using the jet skis, because while the jet skis are in, there's really no room for a figure to fit in there as well. But once they're out, it makes a perfect storage area. If a detachable Cobra submarine pod sounds familiar, well, the 1988 Cobra Bug didn't do it first. That distinction goes to the 1987 Sea Ray, 
which I have here detached from the main glider wing, which would have been the back portion of this vehicle. Well, the G.I. Joe forces always seemed a bit short when it came to medium-sized watercraft throughout the late 80s. Basically, the only one vehicle which really comes to mind as a rival to the Cobra Bug is the 1984 Killer Whale hovercraft. Both are land and sea vehicles, as well as having deployable scout vehicles in the form of a water scout and a motorcycle for this guy. And while this one has a submarine, this one also has depth charges. And they're both heavily, heavily armed. So they're very much the equal of one another. The Secto Viper comes with two infuriatingly hard to find accessories. The first one is the pistol, a very strange looking triangular sci-fi looking thing. As well as a removable bubble helmet. It just snaps onto the rim there. Now it may be a little bit hard to see, but there are actually notches, one on the front there and one at the back, which correspond to slight divots on the inside of his collar there. Now these are fairly hard to find, but you might see quite a lot of these both on the aftermarket because there have been uh, reproductions made of these. The problem with that is that I have seen some sellers mistaking the reproductions for originals. Now I don't really know what the uh, reproductions are like, but I have noticed that sometimes the reproductions are just too clear. For a bubble helmet from back in 1988, this thing does have a slight amount of wear on it and a slight amount of yellowing on it. I mean, sure, it's not really coming out on the, uh, on the video all that well. It looks pretty mint on the video, but trust me, there is a bit of age wear to this. The same goes for the uh, pistol. Most of the time when you see reproduction pistols, especially the things that are really, really small, sometimes the detail is a bit mushy on the reproduction, whereas the detail on an original like this is going to be very sharp and crisp. I think his outfit is perfectly suitable for him to be a amphibious vehicle driver or even a submarine pod driver, as the yellow I know a lot of people really don't like bright colors on their military figures, but let's face it, the yellow is there so that he can be spotted in the dark waters if he has to be rescued. Whether or not Cobra actually rescues their own is up to you. Now he does have a lot of black on him, mostly as trim. Unfortunately, the black kind of hides the red Cobra symbol on his bicep there. And speaking of red, he has these cables coming out of his collar here. I'm assuming that that's um, oxygen or some type of pressurized thing to go along with when he has his uh, bubble helmet on here. But it's actually kind of strange that it's one of the things which is picked out in paint, but there's a lot of other detail, a lot of other um, cables and whatnot on him, which is not picked out in paint and is very hard to see because, well, bright colors like yellow tend to wash out detail. He's pretty much unpainted on his back. According to the pre-production artwork found in Dave Dorman's American Hero book, we actually have a picture of the Secto Viper. And as you can see, a lot of the things which I thought would have been picked out in paint are in fact not. They're all supposed to be just, well, yellow. Except for maybe those cables along his legs could have been like red or something like that, but they're definitely predominantly yellow. So he really doesn't have a lot of uh, variance in color. I 
Of course, with his bubble helmet on, he actually shares a theme with his vehicle. The bug also has a lot of bubbles on it, as well as some spherical protrusions on the side doors. Of course, one has to wonder what exactly secto means. Well, maybe it means insectoid? I, I don't really know. I'm not really sure <laughs> what secto by itself is supposed to mean in this case. But he isn't the first submarine commander. We get the Sea Slugs in 1987 for the Cobra side. So just who would the opposite number for the Secto Viper be on the G.I. Joe side? Well, I've already pointed out that 1988 Cobra Bug's opposite number can only be the 1984 Killer Whale. So in we have everyone's favorite Coast Guardsman, Cutter from 1984, the driver of the Killer Whale. Now, one thing that I've noticed in the 1989 Deep Six review is how much of a deep sea diver the guy uh, look this guy has. So I was thinking that, of course, as a submarine driver, we also have the 1984 version of Deep Six, not the 1989 version, because this one also shares that bubble helmet. If you're looking for a Cobra bug on the aftermarket, I'm sorry to warn you that they have risen in value quite recently. As a matter of fact, I was quite confident in getting one of these fairly cheaply not too long ago, but it didn't turn out that way for me, which I'll get into in just a bit. Now, the Cobra bug is by no means a rare vehicle, and even though you can see it has a lot of detachable parts, they're fairly easy to find. I would say 99% of them on the aftermarket fairly easily. What you do have to look out for is the figure, which is the thing that which kind of bumps up the price sometimes. And of course, whether or not some of the parts are broken. This thing does have a fragility problem. Now, like I've said here, the uh, figures, helmet and the pistol are really what you have to look out for. They're really what bumps up the price of the figure and the figure bumps up the price of the Cobra. Uh, bug if you're buying one complete. Of course, there are reproductions of the helmet and the pistol, which you have to look out for. If you don't really mind that, try not to pay too much for it if you notice that they are reproductions. But like I said, this thing has a fragility problem. Now, as you can see on the submarine pod, it has veins at the back, which just like the 1984 killer whale, are the most easily broken parts of this vehicle. They have tiny little pegs which uh, go into the rod here, which of course snap off fairly, fairly easily. What's worse is the fact that this thing was actually designed to actually sit on the surface on the rod with the bottom of the turret here. So of course, if you're fiddling around with a figure in here, trying to push them into the seat or whatnot, and you just have the pod just out by itself on the ground. You may think it's sturdy, but you're actually putting pressure on the back portion of this thing, and you're gonna crack this thing off. Of course, when it's attached to the bug itself, it doesn't really matter because it's kind of raised up and it's being held in uh, by the clips here, which is the other problem. Now this is something which is fairly hard to see sometimes in photographs, but this top notch here, which you have to just sort of raise a little bit, is something which is fairly easy to crack off. And then of course, as I mentioned, this thing has wheels, but mostly at the back of the vehicle, meaning that the vehicle, when it's kind of weighed down with like figures and whatnot in it, it actually points a bit downwards. So the chin cannons, on both sides with these tiny, narrow little barrels often snag on something and then snap right off. So that's another thing which you do have to look out for. Honestly, when I bought this, I thought this thing would be fairly easy just to, you know, just sort of part it together. And I have to give a big shout out to Sanitarium Productions who actually did a tear down and uh, restoration of one of these which really showed me what the problems of this vehicle were. And quite frankly, I wound up having to buy another vehicle just to put it together properly. 
the way the original owner unfortunately didn't do. And now let's take these uh, tops. What as awkward as it looks, it looks. It, if you're looking for a Cobra bit. Well, that's all the time I have right now. Please check out my Facebook page for more information and behind the scenes photos for these reviews. Thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for next time to see another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. See you then.